A very good morning and a warm and hearty welcome to all our honorable guests, speakers, delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I, Ms. Anunna Mukhopadhyay, on behalf of the organizing committee of the workshop on rational use of antibiotics jointly organized by Ramakrishna Mission Sheba Pratishthan and Medica Super Specialty Hospital under the AGs of West Bengal Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission would like to extend a hearty welcome to all in joining the workshop. We will begin the two days workshop with a lamp lighting ceremony. I would like to call upon stage Moharaj Shokti Pradhanando, Assistant Secretary Ramakrishna Mission Sheva Pratishthan, Major General Dr. Abhijit Chakraborty, Group Medical Director, Medica Hospitals, Dr. Makhon Lal Shaha, former HOD and Professor, General Surgery, IPGMER and SSKM Hospital, Dr. Professor Pranob Kumar Dash, Principal VIMS, and Dr. Professor Otul Gupta, Vice Principal VIMS for the lamp lighting ceremony. Request to be seated, sirs, and we will just have the Shanti Mantra uh, by Ramakrishna Mission. Yeah. 
I would now like to call upon Moharaj Shokti Pradhanando to deliver the welcome speech. Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritamagamaya Aviravirmayedhi Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Te Namam Pahinityam Om Namashri Yeti Rajaya Vivekananda Suraye Sachit Sukhaswarupaya Swamine Tapaharine <clears throat> Good morning and greetings to all. Today's workshop on rational use of antibiotics as a part of ongoing workshop series jointly organized by Ramakrishna Mission Shiva Pratishthan and Medica Super Specialty Hospitals under the instruction of West Bengal Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission is being ceremonially inaugurated for its journey on 9th and 10th February 2023 at this auspicious Dayananda Hall of Ramakrishna Mission Shiva Pratishthan Needless to mention, Swami Dayananda Ji Maharaj is our founder secretary who started this mission in 1928 on 24th July. It's a great pleasure to welcome on behalf of Ramakrishna Mission Seva Pratishthan all the dignitaries to this August Congregation, August Conference at Dayananda Hall. We are very happy to welcome Dr. Makhanlal Saha, former HOD, General Surgery, 
IPGMER Professor Pranav Kumar Das Principal Ramakrishna Mission Sheva Pratishthan Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences Major General Dr Abhijit Chakraborty Group Medical Director Medical Super Specialty Hospitals Professor Atul Kumar Gupta Medical Superintendent and Vice Principal, Ramakrishna Mission Sheva Pratishthan, Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences. Soon, those who will join us, Dr. Professor Shukumar Mukherjee, Honorable Justice Sri Asim Banerjee, Chairman, and Mr. Arshad Hasan Warsi, Secretary of West Bengal Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission. So it's also a great pleasure to welcome all the delegates present here, held from different hospitals in and around Kolkata to participate in this workshop where in presence of many erudite and eminent scholars, this workshop will provide them a great opportunity for exchange of ideas and sharing of knowledge which will greatly help in serving up knowledge as well as serving the society better. I am sure that this workshop will be an eye-opener for the medical education and health development department doctors and will act as a stimulant for promotion of research in this field. It is also praiseworthy to know that this workshop will also give opportunity to young researchers to make presentations about their innovative ideas and learn from their varied experiences. We on behalf of Ramakrishna Mission Sheva Pratishthan congratulate the distinguished speakers and presenters in advance who will earn unique recognition by virtue of their hard work and academic excellence. International and national campaigns draw attention worldwide to the rational use of antibiotics, available antibiotics. These have been stimulated by high prevalence rates of drug resistance pathogens. The aim of any workshop or congregation is to improve treatment of patients, important topics of overuse and insufficient treatment, related to the diagnostics, therapy, prevention, and exclusion of infectious diseases could be identified. These topics not only play an important role in the discipline of infectious diseases, but are also relevant for other internal medical disciplines. The pivotal issues of the recommendations of, are the irrational use of antibiotics, and insufficient vaccination rates. Swami Vivekananda was a great scientific visionary of all times. He always encouraged the researchful minds to find out the truth on anything only to sustain the invaluable human life. He strongly believed that the scientific attitude is a key to pursuit of truth. He said, do not believe a thing because you read it in a, books, in a book. Do not believe a thing because another has said it so. Find out the truth for yourself. That is realization. He sowed the seeds of Vedanta in the East and the West, in the East and scientific growth of India. He considered the synthesis of East and West as the best model for mankind and for excellence. May Bhagavan Sri Ram, may the blessings of Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna Dev, Holy Mother Sri Sarada Devi, and Yugacharya Swami Vivekananda Ji be showered upon all dignitaries, participants, delegates associated with this workshop. I also pray to the Holy Trinity for the successful innovation and implementation of appropriate usage of antibiotics as is the topic of today's workshop. Thank you, namaskar and regards to all. Thank you, Maharaj. I would now like to call upon Major General Dr. Abhijit Chakraborty to deliver the welcome speech.
honorable dignitaries on the stage and the delegates who have come here, good morning to all of you. I welcome you all on behalf of Medical Super Speciality Hospital. And at the same time, I must express my gratitude to the West Bengal Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission to have given us the opportunity to host this workshop on such a contemporary topic. It was in March 1942 when penicillin as an experimental drug was first used on a patient, Mrs. Annie Miller, who at the time was in her 30s and penicillin cured her and she lived a rich life and lived into her 90s. Thus we started our journey of antibiotics and now 80 years hence we have come full circle to a situation where antibiotic resistance has become a scourge in all hospitals of the world. If you look at few facts and figures, 2019, 4.95 million deaths, which can be related to antibiotic resistance alone. And out of these 4.95 million, the drug pathogen combined of MRSA alone accounts for 100,000 deaths all over the world. And mind you, we are talking of reported deaths. We are not taking into account the data gap of the low-income countries. So what the world has done about it? The world has a number of global action plans, WHO, the Western countries, even our country. And are these plans working? They are to a certain extent in Western countries. What about us? If you look at the very recent figures of ICMR surveillance data, one example, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, an origin threat as per CDC. The resistance as in 2021 in India is 87.5%. That's where we are while trying to treat our patients in ICU. So that's the importance of trying to confront this enemy of antibiotic resistance. If we don't do it, if we think that this problem resides elsewhere and not in my ICU, these MDRs will come and infect us. It will become a resident in our intensive care units. It will contaminate our water and food reserves, spread across community. And I must tell you that this enemy is gaining strength day upon day. And that is how more the reason that we put our heart and minds together and try to confront this enemy. And while doing so, what we must understand is that making plants own do alone. What you have to understand is that plants need to be executed on ground. And once they get executed on ground, we need to have a very resilient and vibrant monitoring mechanism but are these plants really working? That's where we are. Only planning on day one will not help. So that's the reason why, more the reason that we should put our heart and minds together and try to confront this particular enemy. Thank you again. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite on stage Dr. Emil Shaha to deliver the welcome speech. Uh, good morning, Honorable uh, Assistant Secretary of the Ramakrishna Mission Shaya Pradishthan, Shakti Padanandaji, uh, Mr. Obhijit Chakraborty, Medical Director of Medica, Professor Pranav Das, Principal of VIMS, Dr. Atul Gupta, and fellow delegates. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you to this two days workshop. It's a replication of same topic on the next day which is jointly organized by Medica Supervisory Hospital and Bioconistia Medical Sciences under the aegis of West Bengal Clinical Regulatory Commission. Uh, you know that West Bengal Regulatory Commission was established in 2017 and primarily we are uh, concerned with uh, different regulations in private health setup, listening to complaints by 
different aggrieved patients and their relatives. And while going through different complaints, we find that a uh, lot of issues are coming up and the core issues are critical care, surgical care and more often antibiotics. I will find that even a lay person whose patient was being treated in ICU has a feeling that his patient received too much of antibiotics and they start questioning our regime of treatment. And this questioning was on two prongs. One is the cost. Second is the rationality of using these antibiotics. Keeping in this mind, uh, WCRC has taken initiative to organize few workshops. And last uh, few months we organized workshop on critical care, rational fluid therapy. Uh, this is not a uh, total uh, academic exercise. What we feel is the persons who are working in the real field need to get sensitized about the rational care in a critical care setup, a optimal surgical care and more so a rational use of antibiotics. You will find that patient who spends about two to three weeks in ICU will not die before he receives almost all the antibiotics available in the market. That is because of what Maharaj has said is because of antibiotic resistance. There is no way out. You have to resort to the next antibiotics. But if you find that there are some guidelines and I am sure that like even in medical colleges, there is no definite antibiotic protocol in any of the institutions which is need of the day. And in India, we have a AIMS antibiotic guidelines which is published and available in the AIMS website. And you will find there are clear guidelines. Although you will find that this ultimate choice of antibiotic depends on the clinician's assessment of the patient. But if you go through this today's deliberation, I am sure you will find some points where we should have a look and rethink about our antibiotic prescription. I will find a lot of uh, academicians who will speak in forum saying that mild pancreatitis should not be given antibiotics. And you will not find any patient in any of the institution who is under pancreatic disease of antibiotics. So that is a gap between our guidelines and our actual practice. We are in the fear that if you don't give antibiotics and he died of infectious complications, you will be liable, held responsible. But I can assure you that no medical council no commission will hold you responsible if you have followed the standard guidelines. If you follow your hospital policy for admission antibiotics. So the, our idea was to sensitize people working in the real field. What is the current standard? What should be the current guidelines for antibiotic therapy? And how you can think of a rational policy for antibiotics. I hope the deliberation for the whole day will help you to think and change your mindset for having a newer thoughts on rational use of antibiotics. This is an interactive session. At the end of each presentation, you are at liberty to ask questions, clear your doubts. So I hope this interactive session will help you at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon Dr. Professor Pranav Kumar Dash on stage to deliver the welcome address. Shami Shakti Pradhananda, Mr. Pro uh, Major General Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Makhanlal Saha, Dr. Adul Gupta, doctors, students, and other speakers, Professor Mukherjee and Justice Banerjee are yet to come. I am very happy to welcome you all to this two-day workshop on rational use of antibiotics. I am grateful that our protestant has been bestowed with this great job 
to organize this workshop in collaboration with, with Medica Super Speciality Hospital under the Aegis of West Bengal Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission. Using antibiotics optimally is really a great art. It requires a solid plinth of evidence-based scientific information. This scientific evidence-based input is the real guide. Without it, the emerging resistance is ever increasing with time. Given a particular patient, we are quite often put to a very difficult position to decide if antibiotics should be given at all. After having a good case of the probable pathogen, patient's immune status, etc., we decide in favor of introduction of an antibiotic, if at all. Several other points follow to judge on after the suitable samples for culture sensitivities, etc., are sent. Which antibiotic? Again, on evidence base, singly or in combination with any other, in what dosage and frequency, through which route, for how long. So, these all require quite uh, good uh, thought of. We need to consider compatibility with other medications. The patient might be already on. We should also look for adverse reaction, if any. We then eagerly wait for an adequate duration for the desired effect of antibiotics given. If the desired effect is really suboptimal, then we make good effort to decipher the possible reason for such failures. Having the culture sensitivity and other reports ready at hand by then, we may be able to figure out the cause, which could be a wrong choice of antibiotic to developing resistance to drug fever and so on. We then reassess, revise, repeat investigations or recruit newer, in, newer ones in the process incurring increasing cost of the patient management. So to optimize the usage of antibiotics, the emerging need of antibiotic stewardship is being increasingly perceived. I sincerely hope this workshop would enrich us a lot in the subject of proper usage of antibiotics. I, on behalf of our Pratishthan, once again very heartily welcome you all to this workshop. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now like to uh, request uh, Dr. Prabhudhu Mukherjee and Dr. Tonma Banerjee uh, to felicitate Moharaj Shokti Pradhanando with a small token of appreciation. Thank you, sirs. I would now request Moharaj Shokti Pradhanando to felicitate the other dignitaries with a small token of appreciation. Dr. Chakrabarti, sir. Dr. Emil Shah, sir. Dr. Professor Pranab Kumar Dash.
Dr. Professor Otul Gupta. Thank you, sirs. Thank you, Maharaj. Request all to take your seats in the hall, please. Be sharing a few words, and then we move on to the next sessions. Honorable guests, uh, Secretary Maharaj, uh, our honorable member, Dr. Emil Saha, the doctors present here and the uh, uh, president medica komal dashura it is a great opportunity to be here i was in malda yesterday i have just come in the morning from there and i thought it very important to be here because of the fact that the Commission has a purpose to hold such workshop, such interactions. The, the attendance of the participants, it has to be seen whether it is up to the desired level or not. Anyway, we had communicated to all concerned that and they were supposed to be present here. This uh, the protocol for a for use of antibiotic was discussed at a very highest level. There it was uh, resolved, or rather, it was di directed that there should be a conference wherein. It will be discussed in detail. Our purpose to hold this, this workshop is not to formulate a standard procedure on our behalf. Rather, whatever standard procedures are there, that has to be circulated and that has to be properly communicated and if after deliberation in, the, in this uh, session there are proposal for some modification or rectification in that case the commission will be making a recommendation that is the entire purpose so it should be kept in mind that whatever is discussed here today, it must be uh, from the standard procedures on the use of the antibiotics, which AIMS has given, which Government of India has given, which the state government has given, which Directorate Health Services has given. So all those standard procedures should be discussed here. And for implementation of those standard procedures, we have to be, to make, we, uh, we have made this awareness. The doctors are in, at some places, there, is, there may be confusion, what is the standard procedure? So that standard procedure has to be discussed here today. Our honorable member, Dr. Emil Saha, he's a surgeon, he's here and he, he will be guiding us on the entire topic. He's a renowned surgeon. Uh, and the participants who have come, I do believe that you will get a light from here and whatever we discuss here, it will benefit you. And whatever uh, suggestion, whatever feedback we get from all of you, we would, we would like to make a comment on that 
after due deliberation in the commission. Our chairperson uh, was supposed to be here, but again we, we came together from Malda, and naturally he, he will take a little time, uh, and he will be coming again here, he will be coming here in the second half, so I thought it better that I should be here in the first half, and uh, he, will be, uh, he will be in the second half. But at the same time, I have come to know here that Dr. Professor Shukumar Mukherjee will be coming here. Despite all his illness, sickness, and indisposition, uh, he will be here. Uh, he, is a, he is a mandarin of medical fraternity. So if he comes, again he will throw light on the issues because in that meeting at the highest level, he was there. And he was given the responsibility to initiate uh, a discussion on it. So he is the appropriate authority uh, to speak and to take decision on the matter. He will be coming here soon. I would not like to lengthen my, my speech. My only request, let it be very fruitful so that uh, it, it helps the, it helps the uh, service recipients it helps the patient. It helps us to save lives. And with these words, I would like to end my speech. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will begin with the first session of the day by Dr. Shanjay Bhattacharya, Senior Consultant Microbiology, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. Dr. Bhattacharya will be speaking on antibiotic stewardship. Sir, request you to be on stage, please. Good morning and uh, it is my proud privilege to be here with you and share my experience about antibiotic stewardship. Now I come from Tata Medical Center which is a cancer care hospital and uh, the principles of antibiotic microbial stewardship are not different be it a specialty hospital or a general hospital and uh, I would be speaking from the point of view of a clinical microbiologist um, and uh, take you through the different aspects of antimicrobial stewardship program. Now this is a very important topic and which is, has been practiced for a long time in Western countries but it has become increasingly relevant globally across the world and here we are actually in 2023 discussing antimicrobial stewardship with you. So to begin with, what is antibiotic stewardship? So antibiotic stewardship actually comes under the broad umbrella of antimicrobial stewardship program or AMSP and it is about the judicious use of antibiotics, judicious and rational use of antibiotics to the right patient of the right antibiotic at the right time, at the right dose, at the right frequency, right route of administration, right duration, right combination right quality and right cost. So a lot of things have to go right in antibiotic stewardship program. And this is the purpose of the antimicrobial stewardship team, which is the key component of delivery of the antibiotic stewardship program in any hospital. It is very important for patient care and its importance has been realized more and more as we go across the clinical management of the patients. So what constitutes the AMSP team? So in order to deliver the antibiotic stewardship, one must have an AMSP team, which is the antimicrobial stewardship program team. Now this team make, uh, will consist of various individuals and they should first of all have clinicians in the board. And these clinicians should be preferably from those departments which are high users of antibiotic. For example, critical care medicine, for example, clinical hematology, surgical specialties, as well as from pediatrics. Uh, if possible, it is also uh, recommended to have somebody from obstetrics department to take care of the mother and child aspect of antimicrobial stewardship. Secondly, it should have a clinical microbiologist. It should have preferably an infectious disease physician, a clinical pharmacologist, and a pharmacist 
who ideally should be an antibiotic pharmacist. So this is the constituent of the antimicrobial stewardship team. And I would like to stress again that it is not essential that you have all members of the team, but at the very least, it should have a clinician and it should have a microbiologist. So that is the minimum requirement of an antimicrobial stewardship team. But if you have an infectious disease physician, if you have a clinical pharmacologist, it is more the better. Now, what are the benefits of the antimicrobial stewardship program or antibiotic stewardship? There are certain benefits which are pretty obvious and certain benefits which whose are being realized more and more as time goes by. So number one is that it improves clinical outcome of the patient. So as I said that it is about giving the right dose of the antibiotic of the right type at the right time to the right patient at the right uh, frequency of administration, route of administration, etc. So all these goes to improve the patient's clinical outcome. So there is no doubt about the fact that antimicrobial stewardship is an important clinical standard of care these days. Secondly, it reduces healthcare expenditure because you are continuously reviewing whether a particular antibiotic or a set of antibiotic is useful or not. So that actually, so you may not need three, four antibiotics when one or two antibiotics would do the job. So, and also it is about optimizing the treatment of the patient so that if you are giving the right antibiotic at the right dose and everything is right, you are expecting a better outcome of the patient. The patient stays in the hospital less, patient has less diagnostic investigations and the overall outcome of the patient is actually better. Secondly, thirdly, it's, it reduces length of hospital stay. And these are for the reasons that I have already told you about, that uh, when the patient outcome improves, there are less complications. And because there are less complications, there are less investigations and less need for the patient to stay in the hospital. So it reduces the length of the hospital stay of the patient. And last but not least, it reduces antimicrobial resistance, which is a very important part of the antimicrobial stewardship program. Antimicrobial stu uh, resistance, in short, is known as AMR. And it is an important fact of life that antimicrobial resistance has spread all across the world. And in India, it is a major problem. <clears throat> so what are the tools for antimicrobial stewardship? So there are certain instruments or tools which are essential for antibiotic stewardship and these include the hospital antibiogram, the microbiology laboratory reports, the hospital antibiotic policy and the hospital antibiotic policy should have an empirical treatment guideline, it should have a targeted therapy guideline and it should have a prophylactic guideline, principally the surgical prophylaxis guideline. In addition to that, there should be an antibiotic formulary for the hospital so that the hospital pharmacy knows which drug to keep and which brand to keep of a particular drug so that timely availability of the antibiotic is not an issue for the hospital and the patients. The last but not least, this is an optional mm, tool which is the availability of therapeutic drug level monitoring. So there are certain drugs where the efficacy is drug, is de of the drug is dependent on the particular drug level because there are actually pharmacogenic, pharmacogenetic differences between individuals and also because of variable pharmacokinetics we are not able to say with the standard dose whether the drug is actually going to be effective or not. So for those situations particularly drugs like voriconazole or posaconazole so all these azole group of drugs it is important to have a therapeutic drug level monitoring facility in the hospital. Sometimes the therapeutic drug level facility is even for to reduce toxicity. For example, if you are giving gentamicin or if you are giving amikacin, it is ideal to have a therapeutic drug level monitoring facility. If you are giving HIV protease inhibitors, which is a different era in itself, you need a therapeutic drug level monitoring facility. But this is a sort of a conditional recommendation that one should have a therapeutic drug level facility in the hospital to augment the antibiotic stewardship program. But the other things, particularly the presence of a hospital antibiogram, the presence of the microbiology laboratory reports, which are quality assured, the presence of the hospital antibiotic policies and the presence of a hospital formulary are keystones 
for having an antimicrobial stewardship. So what are the stewardship uh, triad? Now antibiotic stewardship best works when it is associated with the diagnostic stewardship and infection prevention and control stewardship. What is diagnostic stewardship? It is about ensuring that the right patient gets the right diagnostic investigation at the right time, at the right cost, at the right quality. So now, and this, when we are talking about diagnosis, it is not just about diagnosis of infections, it is about all types of diagnosis, be it hematological investigations, be it biochemical investigations, be it histopathological investigations, endoscopic investigations, or investigations relating to imaging techniques like X-ray, CT scan, MRI, PET scan, etc. So all types of diagnostic investigations may help in actually optimizing the treatment of the patients with regard to antibiotics. And it is important during the ward rounds to ensure that the right patient gets the right set of diagnostic investigations and antibiotic stewardship program. So antibiotic stewardship works best when it is present, it is working in the presence of this triad of diagnostic stewardship, infection prevention and control stewardship. So this is to keep in mind that it will not work well if the other two stewardship components are actually not present. So what are the drugs or medicines that are uh, covered in the antimicrobial stewardship program? The antibiotic stewardship, as I told you, is only one part of the antimicrobial stewardship. So there is a broader umbrella of the antimicrobial stewardship in which comes the antibiotics against the bacteria, the antiviral agents, the antifungal agents, the antiparasitic agents, and also disinfectants and antiseptics. So the optimal use of all of them are important for an antimicrobial stewardship program. So when we are actually going for the ward rounds to see the patient, either as a clinical microbiologist or an infectious disease physician or a clinical pharmacologist, in association with our ICU team members or hematologist or any, any department where antibiotics are being used, we should be looking at all these components in the management of the patient. So what are the key antibiotic stewardship interventions? So there are certain interventions which are pretty important for antibiotic stewardship. So these include the prescription audit, prospective feedback to the particular clinicians, pre-authorization, formulary restriction, change from empirical treatment to targeted treatment, escalation therapy, de-escalation therapy, IV to oral switch, OPAT, which is outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy and selective reporting of antimicrobial susceptibility test reports by the microbiology laboratory. So one can use a variety of different interventions to ensure antimicrobial stewardship and as you can see that it is actually a teamwork because it is not possible for one member of the team to do all. Some part is done by the microbiology laboratory, some part is done by the clinician, some part is done by the infectious disease physician or the clinical microbiologist or the clinical pharmacologist who sees the patient. So all these come on to make antimicrobial stewardship and useful intervention. What is the importance of the microbiology lab in antimicrobial stewardship? Now, it is important to realize that without a properly functioning and quality assured microbiology department, it is not possible to have an antimicrobial stewardship program. So a proper microbiology department which has quality assured results is important for antimicrobial stewardship. So this is towards the, because it facilitates diagnostic stewardship, it facilitates targeted therapy, it facilitates empirical treatment, targeted therapy because it identifies the organism, empirical treatment because it gives a hospital antibiogram which facilitates in the empirical treatment of infections. It also preserves the high-end antibiotics through selective reporting. Now, some hospitals would be practicing selective reporting, particularly if the prescribers are not very well aware or very well informed about the harsh effects of high-end antibiotics. And through the hospital antibiogram and prepar um, uh, preparation, it can monitor the trends in antimicrobial resistance. So that's an important fact that the microbiology laboratory can do. And it facilitates interpretative reading. So if the, if the organism isolated, let's say drug-resistant organisms like having an ESVL producer, 
it would be resistant to first generation cephalosporin second generation cephalosporin third generation cephalosporins also and the beta lactam antibiotics so so you need not actually do the sensitivity for all these categories so if it is esbl it is resistant to the uh, the, to the penicillins, it is resistant to cephalosporins, so that is a given. So that is the example of an interpretative reading. And finally, quality assurance of the microbiology lab data. So these are the key functions of the microbiology laboratory, which is one of the cornerstones of the antimicrobial stewardship program. So how is actually antimicrobial stewardship done? It is done by two different methods. One is called formulary restriction or pre-authorization which is much more resource intensive, but probably the government hospitals can do that. The government can actually restrict what antibiotics to be made available and what antibiotics may not be made available and which antibiotics require a pre-authorization from the antimicrobial stewardship team before it can be used in the patient. But more, more practical way of doing things, particularly for those centers who are entering into the antimicrobial stewardship program, is prospective audit and feedback. Now that requires a regular involvement with the patients, particularly in, in areas where antibiotics are used in high measures, particularly the intensive care unit or other wards where antibiotics usage is high. So there it involves the clinical assessment of the patient, diagnostic report communication and discussion with the primary, uh, primary team, diagnostic stewardship, prescription audit and feedback, and optimization of the antimicrobial treatment. So all these are components through which antimicrobial stewardship is done. So one needs to have a holistic understanding of the patient. One needs to actually be looking at the patient from all points of view, its nutritional requirements, its, <clears throat> its uh, fluid requirements, its other drug requirement. Those are also part of the total assessment of the patient. Now, who are the stakeholders of the antimicrobial stewardship program? The stakeholders are many of the antimicrobial stewardship program. The first stakeholder is the patient and the patient relatives because they are actually the, at the receiving end of the antimicrobial stewardship program. Apart from that, there is a hospital administration, there is the primary clinician, the hospital drugs and therapeutics committee, the AMSP team, the microbiology department, the infectious disease physician, and the clinical pharmacology department. So these are the main stakeholders of the antibiotic stewardship program. So if you are want to re reinforce the activity of the program, reach out to these groups to reinforce the program of antimicrobial stewardship. But there are certain pressure points, and these are jobs to be done with regard to antimicrobial stewardship. So what are these jobs to be done in the country? So there is a lack of clinical microbiologists. So microbiologists are not actually trained adequately clinically with regard to, micro, uh, to, to cl do clinical microbiology. So the laboratory-based microbiology is there and there is clinical microbiology is there. The way the training of microbiology happens in this country is predominantly laboratory oriented. But you need a clinical approach to microbiology so that the basic MBBS doctor with an MD degree in microbiology is able to assess the patient and make a differential diagnosis, think about the treatment options and provide the right sort of diagnostic stewardship infection prevention control advice and antimicrobial stewardship. So that is lacking. There is also lack of infectious disease physician and clinical pharmacologist in the country. There is the microbiology laboratory infrastructure may not be present in all the hospitals of the country, although it is there in the tertiary care hospitals, but in the primary care or in the secondary care, this sort of infrastructure may not be adequate. There is a need for quality assurance of the microbiology laboratory reports. This can be done through NABL accreditation of the microbiology laboratory tests. The quality of the antimicrobial drugs is also important because there is a plethora of drugs in the market. Some are high cost, some are low cost. It is not always that the low cost antibiotics are bad, but sometimes we find reports either from quality control agencies or from our own experience that some of these drugs are not of the same quality. There is a cost of antimicrobial treatment. Again, the cost is a major issue because it costs a lot of money. And there is clinical awareness and uh, prescriber training is important. And that has to be a continuous process with the clinicians and the prescribers. And the appropriate and adequate 
uh, stock of the drugs should be available in the hospital pharmacy. So this is an essential requirement for an antimicrobial stewardship program. So why are we discussing this? It has been found out that in a given year in India, one million deaths occur every year in the neonatal period only. And out of this, about 200,000 deaths are related to infections. Out of this 200,000 deaths, about 56,000 deaths seem to occur because of antibiotic resistance. So almost 60,000 deaths a year in neonates, that is in the first four weeks of life, seems to occur in India from antimicrobial resistance in neonates. So this is a very, the very, very significant and alarming figure. And this, this, is the, this is the tip of the iceberg. So a child born within four weeks, there is a 60,000 deaths occurring on a yearly basis as a result of antimicrobial resistance. So it's a huge problem. The second, second aspect is that <clears throat> antibiotics are used in large numbers. So we are one of the three largest use of antibiotics in the world, as the other two countries being China and the United States. But we top the list. We take about 13 billion antibiotic pills every year on a regular basis. So that means, so we have a population of about 1.4 1, 1 billion. So that means that all of us, that on the average are taking about 10 antibiotic pills a year. So that's an alarming figure with regard to uh, the usage of antibiotics. The third thing uh, I would like to say is that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, has outlined certain important requirements with regard to antimicrobial stewardship. For the first among them is about leadership commitment. Others are accountability, there is, <coughs> uh, uh, there is uh, the, uh, what is called uh, action, action is required, tracking of the, is required, reporting of the result is required, education is required, and drug expertise is required. So all these are essential requirement of antibiotic stewardship policy. Now we may not have the leadership commitment in all the institutions with regard to antimicrobial stewardship. Mainly it is because of the lack of awareness about the problem. So one actually aspect of this particular presentation is to make the larger leadership aware of the problem of antimicrobial resistance and emphasize the importance of antimicrobial stewardship infection prevention and control, and diagnostic stewardship. Now, these are some of the recommendations from the World Health Organization. I would not go into the details of them, but just to name a few, there is a need for immunization. Immunization and vaccination plays a very important part in reducing antibiotic consumption. And the second one is the wash, which is the water sanitation and hygiene. So without water sanitation and hygiene, we would not be able to actually do infection prevention and control and antimicrobial stewardship would not be operating in the right environment without water sanitation and, and hygiene. This is one of the recommendations of the World Health Organization. Now, antimicrobial stewardship governance structure should include, as I have said, AMSP committee and the AMSP team. Now, many hospitals are doing AMSP without having an AMSP committee and the, and the team. And likewise, the Drugs and Therapeutics Committee. So these are essential requirements for antimicrobial stewardship. The sooner we have these systems in place, the better for the AMSP program. Now, healthcare facility are elements of the AMSP programs for low middle income countries. So it is not that only the high end corporate hospitals can do AMSP. Any hospital with with even little resources can do AMSP because it is about training, it is about awareness, it is about doing the right things at the right time. It does not require a fantastic high technology to do AMSP. But the main thing again that is being emphasized over here is leadership commitment and accountability. So the clinicians who are prescribing the antibiotics to the patient, they should take responsibility that uh, about antibiotic prescription an antibiotic policy and monitoring hospital antibiogram. Now, this is a larger issue. It has been shown in a study previously in Europe that antibiotic resistance is related to poor governance and corruption. Because there are many aspects of the policy which can be corrupted because of poor governance, which could be corrupted because of corruption. And this graph shows that antibiotic resistance is highest where the governance is the least. Antibiotic resistance is highest 
where the corruption is a maximum. So we are talking not just about one type of corruption, we are talking about corruption at all phases of life. While we are buying medicines, while we are selling medicines, while we are producing medicines, while we are dispensing medicines, while we are administering medicines, or while we are prescribing medicines. So without a control about governance and corruption, it is not possible to have actually adequate level of antimicrobial resistance containment on the long run. Now this is a slide about the quality of the medicines and there are reports in the literature and some of them we have also published to which show that the quality of the, all the, all the dr generics uh, compared to the international brands or compared to the original brand is not the same. So there are multiple, so we are not saying that all generics are bad but we are only saying that there is a need for quality control of the medicines so the regulatory agency should, should, should play a more proactive part in seeing the quality of the medicines because sometimes it happens we are giving the right antibiotics at the right dose at the right time but it is not acting. The reason is because the quality of the medicine has not been standardized. Sometimes there are contamination issues, sometimes there are active pharmaceutical ingredient deficiency issues and all sorts of stabilization issues, transport issues, storage issues, etc., etc. This is the cost of the antimicrobial agents and we will see that the cost of the antimicrobial agents are significant. These are some of the commonly used antibiotics that are used in the hospitals. And you can see that some of, sometimes these antibiotics are used in combination. So the total cost to the patient can be significant when we are talking about antimicrobial uh, stewardship. So cost containment is an important issue, but the quality also, so we cannot also compromise on the cost and lose the patient. So saving the life of the patient is important, but at the same time we should make sure that the patient does not lose the life in the process. Now, antimicrobial stewardship is a larger part of infection management and sepsis management. This is the one hour sepsis bundle. So these are a set of interventions which has to be done within an hour for actually saving the life of the patient. Antibiotic is just one of them. What I would like to say is that, that antimicrobial stewardship should be there along with stewardship of the other aspects of medical management of the patient. Unless we do the necessary investigations at the right time, unless we are giving adequate fluids at the right time, unless we are actually doing the other additional investigations and management at the right time, we cannot save the life of the patient. Antibiotic itself is not enough. So to conclude, I would say antibiotics are precious resources and please handle with care because they are very important medicines which have been developed in less than 100 years time. It was the first one came about 80 years time and it has changed the life of ours, but these are precious resources which need to be handled with care. Thank you for your attention. I am sorry to overtake the time. Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Sir, uh, two tool bolen, sir. Ekta hoche formula restriction, aur ekta hoche prospective audit and feedback. So, sir, uh, effectively ki have a so we have shown in a particular slide how antimicrobial stewardship program should actually take place. Let me just go back to the previous slide just a minute. So if you see this slide, we are saying that you have an AMSP team. Now that team comprises of a clinical microbiologist, an infectious disease physician, the primary physician, clinical pharmacologist, and they have to first clinically assess the patient. After clinical assessment of the patient, there has to be a diagnostic report communication with the primary team. 
and discussion about the implication of the diagnostic results. At the same time, there has to be a practice of diagnostic stewardship to make sure that the, all the necessary diagnosis has been done at the right time and uh, we understand the implication of the diagnostic results. Next is a prescription audit. So we should look at the prescription and see what are the necessary drugs, what are the essential drugs, what are the unnecessary drugs. And last but not least, we should actually be doing optimization of antimicrobial treatment. So these are the five steps I could think about while regarding the prospective audit and feedback on a daily basis. Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentations. I'm a bit slow. Uh, most of the time in our city of Calcutta, we don't have an infection control committee in the hospital. And so the essential ingredient of antibiotic stewardship program is usually auditing and second pre-authorization. And second point is there's networking between the clinical microbiologist and the clinician is utterly lacking. These are the two negative points. That's why we are all going to prescribe antibiotics on empirical grounds and across the counter. And these things has to be implemented in all hospitals. It's a binding. How many times we have got auditing? Auditing is very important and pre-authorization and planning for the future, then you can control it. High-end antibiotic use is a prerogative of every doctor. And in that case, I think if we implement these two things, antibiotic stewardship program will come out successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Just a minute, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, for enlightening all. I would now like to call upon Dr. Makhon Lal Shaha to felicitate Dr. Bhattacharya with a small token of appreciation. So Dr. Bhattacharya has uh, brought out the first point as I uh, made my comment in the opening uh, session that today we are having all the large clinical establishment and I am sure most of the hospital does not have such uh, stewardship program or infection control committee. So as uh, part of the commission we will expect time has come now for the installation to create at least some form of infection control committee or AMS so that at least people who are in ICU setup or who are receiving antibiotics for longer time. You see, antibiotic is not the right answer for preventing death. There are a lot of deaths happening after using almost all antibiotics. So we should review. This infection control committee should review the antibiotic use from the particular situation and as part of commission, we will see that this is being followed in different establishments. So that is the first and most important part of this workshop that we expect all establishments should have such committee who should start functioning. Thank you. Go to the next session. Uh, we will break for tea for 10 minutes and then we will come back with the next sessions. <laughs>